Hi, um, I'm Hannah Nyren. I'm the digital marketing manager at the MIT Press. Um, and I am your host for this episode of MIT Press Live. So today we are speaking with two very special MIT Press authors. Um, we have Jathan Sadowski, the author of Art, and Meredith Broussard, um, the author of Artificial Unintelligence. Hi guys, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? Great, it's great to be here. Great, great to have you both here. Um, so to start off, tell us where you two are dialing in from today. Um, Meredith, let's start with you. Where are you today? I am coming to you from New York City. Awesome. And uh, Jason, where are you dialing in from? I'm, in, I'm on the Antipode in Melbourne, Australia. I'm coming to you from the future. It's uh, Wednesday morning here. <laughs> That is really weird to think about. <laughs> Thanks for uh, waking up so early to join us. No worries. Um, so to start off, you know, you both have published two different books with the MIT Press. So to start off, let's talk a little bit about yourselves and the books that you've published. So, um, you know, Jason, could you start by telling us about yourself and the book you've published with the MIT Press? Yeah, sure. So I'm Jathan Sadowski, and right now I'm a, I'm a research fellow at the Emerging Technologies Research Lab uh, at Monash University, um, which is a, you know, a great place for the, for the topic of my book. It's a social science research lab within a faculty of information technology, which is really what, um, in, in many ways, Too Smart is all about, right? It's really kind of trying to engage um, very deeply with these smart technologies, the kind of data-driven, network-connected, automated technologies that are becoming ubiquitous, but do so uh, with this kind of social science perspective, uh, with, with the aim of trying to uncover um, how these technologies are kind of fitting into broader political and economic structures and systems and how they are materializing um, certain, certain interests and certain values. And uh, you, Meredith, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your book? Hi, everybody. My name is Meredith Broussard. I am a data journalism professor at NYU. Data journalism is the practice of finding stories in numbers and using numbers to tell stories. And my book with the MIT Press is called Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. It's about the inner workings and the outer limits of technology. Great. Thanks, Meredith. Um, so, you know, these two fabulous books were published at different times and from different perspectives, but both are relevant to smart technology. So let's start there. What do you think is the main problem with smart technologies today? Um, Meredith, we can start with you this time. <laughs> Oh, Jathan, why don't you take this? Because you are a smart guy who has a book called Too Smart. So uh, <laughs> why don't you kick us off and talk about smart? Sure. And then you, you can riff off of it because I feel like we have very, oh, I, I don't feel like I know, we have very complimentary uh, books and very complimentary takes on this topic. So for me, the, the main problem with smart technology, and I really try to explore this in, in the book a lot, is really looking at um, what, you know, whose interest are, are kind of driving the design and the creation of these technologies and, and what kind of, uh, you know, overarching imperatives are, are also being, you know, baked into the design and creation of these technologies. And so from, for me, I, I, I'm, in, in the book, I try to map out how um, there's this kind of, on one hand, this imperative of data collection. So I think a big problem with smart technologies is that they have this kind of maximalist approach to surveillance, to data um, collection baked into them. It's about collecting, you know, fine-grained, high-resolution data about every single possible thing, every, everybody, everything, in any way possible. Um, but then on the other hand is also what I call this imperative of control baked into these smart technologies, where it's about um, enacting kind of this, you know, remotely or automatically um, 
control over uh, over things, of course, but also uh, in, in I think a more insidious way, um, a form of social control at various different scales. And so for me, the, the, the main problem with smart technology is that um, th these are not like un unintended consequences, but they're features, not bugs, right? Th this is the, the purpose of these technologies is to perpetuate these two imperatives. And do you think the problem starts with the name smart technology? Because to me, uh, the, the name itself is problematic because it implies that the device has agency, that the device has intelligence. And this is a problem in artificial intelligence as well, which is what I, I, you know, I write AI in order to commit acts of investigative reporting. I research about AI. I research about the other ways that people are using AI. And it's very, very confusing for people because we get confused between the real AI, which is just math, and the imaginary AI which is the Hollywood stuff. And I feel like with smart technologies, because we're calling it smart and because smart is something that people are, uh, it humanizes, it anthropomorphizes the object and kind of gives it more power. Yeah, 100%. And I like that we both kind of play with this idea in the in the titles of our books right artificial unintelligence and for me the title of the of my book too smart came from actually when i was writing the conclusion um and trying to sum up like you know what the problems are and what where we go from here um i i in writing i wrote you know these technologies are becoming too smart for our own good and i was like ooh, too smart that's 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 the pithy title right there um and and uh, I, I think you're right, Meredith, that they, they do have baked into them this kind of normativity, right? That, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be dumb. You want to be smart. You don't want to be stupid. You want to be intelligent. Um, and, and so baked into them is this very human um, kind of normativity that, that, as you say, kind of anthropomorphizes and, and, and hides the power that they have and and whose power that they kind of represent. Yeah, and it's kind of insulting, honestly, that if I don't want to use a smart uh, smart thermostat, for example, then the implication is the person who does not use the smart thing is the dumb person. Hmm. And it is a totally valid choice to get a thermostat that you know, does not have wireless connectivity built in. It is a perfectly valid choice to not connect your refrigerator or your washing machine to the internet. And I just, I, I think it's a little nutty that, uh, <laughs> that people are trying to connect absolutely everything to the internet. On the other hand, I am also the kind of person who uh, builds, uh, I build digital stuff for fun. And so I, I, I have built digital systems to automatically water my garden, for example. So I am, I am in favor of, you know, oddball uses of, uh, oddball uses of digital technology, but the, the nomenclature is smart. I think, I think you're right. We really need to examine the way that we're using this nomenclature and also kind of unpack the way that these devices are, uh, you know, insinuating themselves into the various aspects of our lives. Yeah, and, and they have this expansionist logic. I mean, we can see it in things like um, um, IBM's o overarching umbrella initiative is called Smarter Planet. And they're very explicit that this is, uh, you know, th this is, this is the, as they, as they call it, this is the assertion of a worldview, right? That the, that the planet needs to be made smarter. So that, that tells you a little bit about their ambitions, um, and, you know, the planetary scale or like um, s other companies like Cisco and Simmons talk about a universe of data, right? So it's like the planet's not enough. It's like there's a whole universe of data out there that we need to tap and we need to uh, extract and, and, and valorize. Uh, and, you know, in, in my book, uh, I, 
I present an argument in favor of a, of a kind of revivalized, reviving of Luddism. Um, I think that and we need to revive the original meaning of Luddism, which was as this kind of very political um, and politically minded and politically directed um, attack on not technology, but on capital, right? On, on the people that were creating technology in order to um, exploit, extract, subjugate, um, people, right? And and it, it's not that these are like super disconnected, whether it's the industrial age or the smart age, the digital age, whatever. I think there's a there's a red thread that r runs throughout um, all of this. And I, I, I like your example, Meredith, of, of, of like tinkering and creating this kind of digital system um, for gardening, because I think it also really highlights that it's like, I mean, that's really fun and great and it can be really useful and convenient. Um, and it also highlights that it's like, you know, that data is not going then to some like big ag tech <laughs> company who's aggregating data about everyone's garden so they, they can sell them, you know, personalized fertilizer or whatever. It's like, no, it's going to you um, because it's something that benefits you and you find fun. Okay, Jathan, don't say that too loud, though, because I think you should be up <laughs> with a new app idea. Uh, <laughs> garden surveillance is probably going to be the new thing. I do that constantly. I'm always like, oh, no, I hope someone's not taking my, my speculations and turning them into a business model. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee they are. <laughs> I know a lot of uh, tech investors, and they probably would. <laughs> um, and it does it does shine a new light on your book, Meredith, to know that you create your own technologies. Though I think that you know technology might be a little less sinister if we were all creating our own and using it for our own purposes and owned our own data. But that's probably another conversation. <laughs> Um, so, can you two share a few examples of the quote-unquote smart technologies that are in use today that are problematic in some way, shape, or form? Well, one of the things that I write about in my book is an idea that I call techno-chauvinism. It's the idea that technology is superior to other solutions, that technological solutions are superior to, say, human solutions. And I argue that we should think about instead, what is the right tool for the task? Sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer, absolutely. And then other times it's something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on its parent's lap. And it's not a competition. One is not better than the other inherently. It's just about the right tool for the task. So I think that this idea of techno-chauvinism is something that we can think about when we think about smart technologies. And we can also think about who's not in the room when the technologies are being made. All right, techno-chauvinism comes from the kind of bias that says, oh, we, the creators of the technology, know better than everybody else. We are ourselves superior and therefore the uh, technologies that we create are naturally good. And the best example of this is the Apple Watch. Now, the Apple Watch uh, launched to lots of fanfare when it came out a couple of years ago, and the narrative was about how it had all these health tracking apps on it. You know, you were supposed to be able to get your Apple Watch and it was going to, you know, magically make you healthier or something. And you know what it didn't have on it is it did not come standard with a period tracker. Now, half of the world tracks their menstrual cycle. And it's just absurd to me that a device that claims to be about one's everyday health would not have a period tracker as a standard app that is installed. In fact, it would be much more equitable for the watch to come with the app installed, and then you have to take it off if you don't need to put it on. So it can make us think about who's in the room, who's not in the room, and you know, make us realize that these technologies are being created without the input of everybody who needs to have input. And so we should diversify the teams that are making technology. 
Yeah, and I think just riffing on that, uh, yeah, I, I also, uh, again, lots of complementary syn synergy going on here in my book as well. I argue that we need to democratize innovation, as I call it, which definitely includes things like, um, exactly like Meredith is talking about, which is, you know, uh, right, right now, we have very much the opposite of, of a kind of dim, democracy of technology or democracy of innovation. We have something that looks much more oligarchic, right? Where it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small group of, of oftentimes, you know, very affluent, wealthy, white uh, men who are making largely the decisions um, about these things. And, and, and uh, Meredith's example of the Apple Watch is a perfect illustration of that. And, and so what you end up doing is you get this kind of vicious cycle where it's like all the VCs look like all the entrepreneurs. And so they just like have this circulation of money and capital and, and innovation be between them. Right. Um, and it, it really shuts out um, it, uh, uh, like the, it shuts out the majority of the world from having representation in this. But also, I mean, even in a technical sense, it just leads to really bad stuff, really bad technologies that don't work. Um, they don't do things that actually benefit people. Um, they, they largely do things that benefit uh, the, the people who are creating them and the interest that, that they have, whether that's the interest to make money, um, to, to sell things, uh, you know. So uh, yeah, I, I think the, what, the, the step towards that is really to think about how do we democratize this? How do we make something democratic? And, and um, you know, in, the, in, in my book, I take this kind of very techno-political approach to technology, um, you know, building on past work where it's like I, uh, understanding technology as a form of legislation. You know, we're in, a, we're in an election year right now. And so it's like if, if you know, if, legis if policy was being made, um, by a, a very small, you know, oligarchic group of people, um, we would at least be outraged by that, as we are. Um, and but but there's something weird about technology where we, you know, I don't think most people have that same um, kind of political mindset, that same kind of approach to just being outraged that you know the vast majority of, of of human society is not represented in something that arguably has more power over our, our everyday lives than any legislation or any policy does right yeah. well one of the books that was really formative for me in understanding how this uh you know this chain of events came to be was uh fred turner's book on uh the development of cyberspace and cyber culture. And I was really surprised to discover that the uh, early pioneers of internet culture were the same people who were living on communes, who were hippies living on communes in the US in the late 60s. And the communes failed, but this group of people took these ideas and said, oh, there's this new, uh, new thing called cyberspace we're going to take our new communalist ideas and we're going to implement them there. And I used to think that hippie, hippie life sounded really glamorous and exciting and awesome and laid back. And then I realized if you were female and you lived on a commune, you pretty much ended up barefoot pregnant and in the kitchen. And that the communes were not uh, diverse places at all. And so it's really interesting the way that uh, those same values have been transported to the online world. And even now, like we are not in the late 60s anymore, but those are still the values that techno libertarians are clinging to, which is, you know, which is fascinating to me. Uh, another book that has been really, uh, really formative for me recently is Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology. She has, uh, you know, gosh, she has so many great points in this book, uh, but there are two that that, uh, that really stick out. Um, one is that technological systems discriminate by default. So every technological system has a base case, has a default. If there is a lack of information, that it inserts the default. It's required computationally because you can't do an equation without a piece of data 
right? And computers are machines that do math. And so when we think about technological systems as, uh, as discriminating by default, it changes the whole frame for how you understand what's going on inside a system. And it's very relevant to policing. Uh, the other thing that she says that's particularly smart um, has to do with technological progress and, uh, and innovation. So I, she makes the point that progress is not innovation. Technological progress is not the same as social progress. And so if we decouple these ideas, it becomes really powerful. Just because we're using more technology does not mean we're creating a better world. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, in talking about shouting out other books that are really formative for, for the work that we're talking about here, um, another MIT press book uh, by, by Mar Hicks, um, Programmed Inequality. And their book is so good um, at really explicitly laying out how the history of computing is also the history of misogyny in, in so many ways, where it's about discarding, as, as they put it in, in, this, in the subtitle, you know, the, how, how Britain discarded women technologists, right? So just kind of discarding this entire half of the population from inclusion in um, the history of developing these, these technologies, but then also baking in so much bias and so much um, kind of, uh, yeah, very traditional social relationships, things like, you know, binary gender systems being baked into social, ser you know, government social service administration systems, right? Um, so, so just kind of, yeah, again, that, the, you know, th this, this work, I think, very much informs the two books that Meredith and I are talking about here. Um, that, and, and it, it's important to recognize that because it's like, uh, you know, well, I, I think this view, I think people are starting to understand um, these points, you know, over time because the scholarship on it keeps piling up. <laughs> and, and not only scholarship, the like really good, accessible, with a critical edge and, a, and, a, and an argument to make, that kind of scholarship keeps piling up that, you know, um, as, as Meredith was putting it, you, you cannot equate... Um, technology with progress, and you cannot equate um, it with neutrality or objectivity. It's, it is quite the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just oh. wanted to ask um, you know, you brought up policing, and I know that there's a lot more to talk about there. How, you know, how are these technologies being used for policing, or how is policing influencing some technologies that are being developed today? Uh, Meredith, you can start, if, yeah. or Jathan. Um, well, I, I'm particularly excited to hear what Jathan has to say okay. about this. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the thing that I'm most interested in, in terms of policing and technology, uh, I'm interested in predictive policing technologies. I'm interested in the use of facial recognition. Uh, both of these things are deeply, deeply problematic. Uh, and I'm very engaged in, and, uh, and I really care a lot about the fight against facial recognition that's happening right now. So in Wales this summer, uh, courts ruled that using facial recognition in policing was unlawful, which is really important in the UK because in London, you are surveilled almost every moment of every day when you are in public. Like that city has more surveillance cameras per square foot than anywhere else in the world, I think. Uh, and in the US, I, somebody who's been doing a lot around facial recognition activism is Joy Bolomwini, uh, who had this groundbreaking project called Gender Shades when she was at the MIT Media Lab as a graduate student. And she, she did a project uh, in which she analyzed the uh, facial recognition systems of the major tech companies, because there are only a couple of them. You know, we kind of imagine that tech is this like wonderful 
diverse place where there's all this innovation and all these startups. No, it's a consolidated industry. There are nine big companies globally, and that's it, and they own everything. Uh, and so she tested the systems from the major manufacturers and found out that they recognize light skin better than dark skin, they recognize men better than women, and dark-skinned women were the group that they were particularly terrible at recognizing. And lots of people would say that, oh, well, you know, the problem is that this algorithm was trained on mostly light-skinned men, so we should just put more training data in of, say, dark-skinned women, and then the system will get better, and then we should use facial recognition. But that's not the solution at all, because facial recognition systems, when they're used in policing, are disproportionately weaponized against vulnerable communities, against communities of color, against poor communities. And so really what we should be doing is we should be saying, let's take a step back. Let's not use these technologies until or unless they are equitable. And guess what? They're never going to be. So we shouldn't use them. So there's actually some legislation that's been proposed in the US to ban the use of facial recognition in policing. There are a couple of cities that have taken steps to uh, ban facial recognition. And the pressure has been such that some of the major manufacturers have taken a step back and said, OK, we're not going to uh, develop these things further for use in policing. However, they have not said, we're going to stop selling this. And they have not said, we're going to take the existing products off the market. So if you're familiar with Clearview AI, mm -hmm. this, was a, uh, this was a company that was involved in a big scandal recently because they were scraping people's social media without permission. And all of the images that they scraped have been bundled into a big database. And now that database is being used in policing, which is deeply problematic. And people should not be doing that. Yeah, and, and Clearview AI just signed uh, like a $750,000 contract with ICE to provide them with facial recognition services, right? So it's like, you know, this, this, this moratorium that, you know, Amazon and Microsoft, you know, saying, oh, we're going to take a year moratorium or, or we're not going to do, you know, we're not going to sell, uh, you know, facial recognition services to law enforcement until there's, you know, good, strong federal regulations in place. I mean, on one hand, um, we have to understand that for what it is, which is a calculated business decision. Um, and it's also, uh, it's also about regulatory capture. I mean, who do you think is going to be writing the policy for that good, strong federal regulation? It's going to be Amazon and Microsoft's lawyers, right? Um, but on the other hand, that also does not mean that they aren't still providing that service to other non-law enforcement um, agencies and that there aren't also uh, companies like Clearview that are providing that service, right? I, I, I think about, you know, with these, these kinds of, um, you know, really powerful uh, and dangerous surveillance technologies like facial recognition, uh, but not, not, not exclusive to that. Yeah, you know, I remember, um, uh, you know, in like the 70s, I think it was, you know, Ralph Nader wrote this book um, called Safe at No Speed, right? Um, about, about cars and the danger of cars. And I, I think, and that's the kind of tact I take to this surveillance, right? It's like, you know, safe, safe at no use. Um, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on board. I'm of the, um, you know, the abolish uh, mindset, right? I'm, I'm, I'm with the, the, the growing uh, group of, of, of activists and uh, scholars and, and, you know, legislators, the public who are saying, you know, you know what, these technologies, it's not about regulating them. It's, uh, it's about abolishing them, right? That, that, that um, it's hard to imagine a, 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 a safe, use of these there it's it's only we can only imagine uh less degrees of danger <laughs> in their use and and that's not and i don't think we should i don't think we should sit back and say that's good enough we should say no that we we should expect more um and and that comes back as well to the point that meredith is making and, and building on ruha's um work as well right that if, if we were just to raise the expectations that we have for technology, for the consequences and outcomes of technology, um, 
a lot of a lot of what exists uh we would deem not not worthy of existing right in in my in my uh, in my book i i argue that we need a kind of like marie kondo for techno politics right it's like um rather than picking up a thing and being does this spark joy we should with every technology pick it up and say does this contribute to um human well-being or social welfare and if not then we should toss it away and it's it's as easy as that See, Jathan, I, perhaps I'm a little bit more depressed than you are about the state of the world because I would settle for like taking every piece of technology and saying, does this comply with the laws of the land in the place where it is being used? Like, I have very low expectations at this that's point. That's a very low bar. <laughs> that's, that, that standard would also... <laughs> that standard would also eliminate like the majority of technology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, no one, no one's ever, no one's ever accused me of being less cynical than the Meredith. I, I, I don't appreciate that accusation. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. You won the cynical prize for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I like this idea of, uh, of a Ralph Nader kind of alert. Um, I have been thinking about this moment that we're in, this moment uh, where uh, you've got books like Jathan's, you've got books like Ruha Benjamin's, uh, you've got algorithms of oppression, programmed inequality, weapons of math destruction. There's, there's just a renaissance around publishing uh, critical technology. And I have been thinking of it as a Rachel Carson kind of moment. Uh, Rachel Carson's mm. Silent Spring was the book that kicked off the environmental movement. And so I hope that this conversation that's happening right now can be the start of a movement for algorithmic justice. Oh, that would be, yeah, that would be so great. I mean, because I, I think that is such a really apt analogy. And I'm very honored to be included in that, as your book is as well, Meredith, for sure, in that renaissance. Um, because, yeah, I mean, Silent Spring led directly to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, it led directly to, as you're saying, this kind of uh, just awareness of um, uh, of the environment as an issue. It also, of course, led to things like greenwashing and, you know, uh, stuff like that, um, which I think also speaks to the kinds of things that we have to just be aware of, right? We have to know that history um, and understand its connection to to the digital, if not the environment, digital ecosystems, if not natural ecosystems, um, but also be uh, aware of, of, of how, um, it's so readily co-opted or, or kind of mis misdirected uh, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, so we do have to go to the Q&A soon, but there is one topic I kind of wanted to cover before we move over there. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about policing and kind of the militariz militarization of technologies. And, and, you know, there's a very sinister side to things there that I think is a little bit more clear than perhaps some more everyday technologies. So what are some everyday technologies or emerging technologies that people are very much lauding as a positive that might have some more negative side effects? Meredith? <laughs> oh, okay, so I would pick self-driving cars. I have a whole chapter in my book about self-driving cars and about the dangers of self-driving cars. So uh, the TLDR is that self-driving cars don't work. They're never going to work. And uh, the racial bias that's baked into uh, facial recognition systems is also baked into self-driving cars. And so, it is, it is very clear who is going to be hit by self-driving cars and who is not going to be hit by self-driving cars because we already know who's going to be recognized as human by self-driving cars, which is people with light skin, and who's going to be recognized as not human, which is people with dark skin. So it's a disaster waiting to happen. I... It, and I could literally talk for hours about the uh, about the problems with self-driving cars. 
I, I will also say that I rode in an early self-driving car uh, and it almost killed me. And so I do not trust that uh, engineers that are that reckless are ever going to make something that is going to be safe enough that I would want my child to be on a school bus with self-driving mechanisms, for example. So oh, yeah, the other thing about self-driving cars is that the big claim about self-driving cars was that they were going to be here by 2020. And here we are in 2020. <laughs> it's a pretty crappy year anyway because of the pandemic and because, you know, America is on fire. Um, but I will also point out that self-driving cars continue to not work in 2020. Yeah, and I mean, coming, you know, being down here in Australia, even, I think even more simply, I've got two arguments against self-driving cars, and that's kangaroos and wombats, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yep, I believe it. Nobody's programming the self-driving cars to accommodate for kangaroos. No. That's something we definitely wouldn't have thought of here, or in Silicon Valley, at least. Um, <laughs> there's no kangaroos there. Except at the zoo. Right? So, um, you know, you, you both have strong feelings about self-driving cars. Um, but, but what else is there that you think, you know, people see as a harmless everyday technology that could be potentially very problematic? Besides oh, everything, I mean, really? Yeah, where, <laughs> where, where to where, start? I mean, where I to, to, where to begin? Tool, but I really don't know what else we can use. <laughs> so I, I will say, um, and so this is, uh, 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 there's a big section in my, in my book, and particularly in the chapter on smart homes, where I talk about how um, things like, uh, you know, smart refrigerators and smart stoves, you know, these smart appliances, um, you know, our Nest thermostat, our, our Nest smoke alarm, uh, are increasingly being not only connected to, but being subsidized by insurance, uh, the insurance industry. Uh, you know, and so that's, that's, that's a really kind of insidious way um, that we don't, we, we don't see how they're kind of integrating into our uh, you know, the insur insurers are finding these ways, and with the Apple Watch as well, right? The, the kind of, you know, wearable devices, finding ways to um, collect really valuable data for them, valuable behavioral data. Again, talk about vehicles as well. I mean, the, the kind of like telematics and in, in vehicles, um, you know, that are installed to know how, when, and where um, people drive, and then use that to um, make kind of highly personalized risk assessments. You know, one insurer calls it the statistic of one, which is the idea that you have so much data about one person that you can run statistically significant analysis on the behaviors of one person, which is this like complete, um, you know, so no longer are you pooling risk or aggregating risk or mutualizing it, right? It becomes hyper individualized. Um, and things like, you know, a smart fridge telling uh, your health insurer, you know, what you're eating and, you know, oh, you, you, you had some, you know, you've got some chocolate cake in there. Well, you know, that's going to come with a discount. But, oh, we see you're eating tofu and quinoa bowls every night. Well, you know, that's, well, we, we were, we're, we're going to reward you for that. So it's just so much of it is about thinking about how these technologies are smuggling in um, a lot of a lot of industries, a lot of interest um, that we we don't even think about, right? And that and that's because we don't read the terms of service because they're designed not to be understood, and so we don't know who you know uh, the the appliance manufacturer, for example, might be selling that data to. Um, we don't know when our insurer offers us a, a subsidy for you know a smart device, which they say you know well. Uh, you know, they, they, they give their own reasons for it, but we don't know exactly how they're going to use that or what, you know, what algorithm they're going to feed that into for risk assessment. And so there, there's, there's so much kind of, uh, yeah, I think just smuggling that happens um, in these technologies. You know, a smart technology is no longer just 
uh, the thing in itself. It's because it's it's networked, because it's connected to the internet. It can ha it's like a TARDIS. If we're going to do a really nerdy example, right? It's a lot bigger on the inside um, than it appears. <laughs> That's perfect. Smuggling is such a great term. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I mean, horrible, but wonderful. Um, I really, you know, it's good to know about that insurance thing because I really don't want my insurance company to know what I'm eating. <laughs> they really no. don't all that pizza. They can also run these kind of nonsensical, uh, nonsensical statistical analyses. Like, uh, you know, how fast do you click on a link? Or uh, if you have the, uh, the devices set up right, like you can analyze the pattern uh, that somebody is, uh, is like pushing on the accelerator, pushing on the brake, and then you can turn that into data and say, okay, well, people who, uh, who push the accelerator faster are more reckless drivers, so we're going to charge them more uh, for car insurance, and people who press the accelerator very slowly, well, they're more careful drivers, so we're going to charge them more. I mean, which is ridiculous, because the, the, the force that you put on the accelerator, I mean, who ever thinks about that? Like, the only reason I think about it is because I get car sick really easily, and so when people drive, like, er, 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 on the, with their foot on the accelerator, I get car sick, so I'm aware of it, but I am also aware that nobody else thinks about this ever. Yeah, that seems like a very arbitrary thing to measure. Yeah, but there are all kinds of arbitrary measurements that are made mm -hmm. in the world of smart devices. And when that data is collected, as Jason said, there's this temptation to physical analyses on an audience of one. And it's almost always bad. It's almost always bad for the consumer. Yeah, I can definitely see that. So, you know, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if anyone wants to ask another question, go ahead and do that right now. Um, we have about 15 minutes left to do some questions. Is there anything that either of you want to add to this conversation before we get into the Q&A? Uh, you know, I, I just pulled up the Q&A and there are some really good questions in there. Jathan, I think we're going to want to talk about the first one. Yeah, I'm, I can read it out loud for you, so so you guys don't have to read through it. Um, but yeah, so the first question, Meredith, you said that the problem with the name SMART is that it implies agency. So what do you think about technical agency, machine agency? Um, start with that part. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is a uh, this comes up a lot in uh, in STS, and it is super interesting to think about. I uh, I think that the idea of the sentient robot uh, has has just a really deep hold on our imaginations, mm -hmm. uh, primarily from Hollywood, but also because it goes back as far as Frankenstein, right? Frankenstein is a monster created from nothing. And that's basically the same fantasy as creating a machine that has a mind, you know, creating a robot out of nothing. Uh, and I'm fascinated by the idea that it's an enduring fantasy, but I think it is just that, a fantasy. Uh, I think that humans have this amazing ability and tendency to anthropomorphize things. Uh, like think about how attached people are to their phones. Like lots of people have this emotional connection to their phone. They want to have it with them when they sleep or when they go to the bathroom, when they're separated from their phone, they kind of feel it physically. And like, it's just a box. Like it's just a collection of circuits, but humans are such social creatures that we just, we want to imbue human uh, tendencies on inanimate objects. And we do this all the time. Like, mm -hmm. we, uh, like, think about, I don't know, if you have a dog or a cat or another kind of pet, like, think about how often you think about your pet's interior life. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's ever had pets, 
you do think about what your pet is thinking about. Like you kind of look at them and they're looking back at you and you're like, what's going through their mind? And so it's, you, you imagine that your pet is sentient the same way that people imagine that their computer could someday be sentient. But, <laughs> you know, I wish that my dog were like thinking about me, but you know, my dog would probably <laughs> think about food or, you know, napping. You, you mute you need a robot dog for that, Meredith. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, that thing for me. <laughs> to build on Meredith's point, um, which is uh, totally right, 100% right. I, I think as well, the, um, you know, the, the work of Kate Darling, who's at the MIT Media Lab, has done so much work on human-robot interaction, and, and she's really shown um, how readily, how, how ready people are to project um, emotions and 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 kind of you know mental and emotional states onto robots, um, but also how uh, how quickly people build these emotional connections to um, robots. So she's done some really interesting experiments, just kind of really laying out that as Meredith is saying, we're, we're social creatures, but that's not only, uh, you know, we don't only project it onto other people, we project it onto the things around us um, as well. And that is, talk about smuggling as well. I mean, I feel like this is a, this is a, a key theme of my book is, is like, what, what does smart technology smuggle in? Um, and when, when, so the, the example that I think about when I think about like machine agency, um, because, you know, a lot of my work is based on this kind of political economy approach. And so I, I think about the, you know, the fear that robots are taking our jobs, right? All, you know, the, the robot, one day the robot's going to walk into the factory floor, tap you on the shoulder and say, you know, bug off. Like, you know, this is my spot now. Um, and, and that the, the, the point is not that automation is not a, a, a threat to to labor um and in in many ways it very much is and it has been for hundreds of years um a threat to labor power and that's by design but it's not that the machines have agency it's whose agency are the machines representing um and and in and and that in that example it's the agency of capital right it's the agency of 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 the people who own um and deploy the robots, the people whose voices um, are in, and values and interests are included in the design and creation of those robots, right? That's that's the agency that's being materialized, that's being represented, that's being made very concrete by the robot or by the machine. Um, and and you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of our talk that you know, in the in my book, I kind of uh, have this argument for a, a revival of Luddism. And I like that because they recognized, the, the original Luddites recognized this very simple point, but this point that has become completely mystified um, in our understanding of technology now that, you know, they, they didn't smash machines because they were, uh, you know, primitivist or afraid of progress or whatever kind of, you know, smears that the technologists of that time laid on them. They, they very um, carefully chose and smashed machines of um, bosses who were notorious for exploiting their workers, for extracting value, for replacing labor power, right? So they were very intentional about it because they knew they were not targeting the machines themselves. They were targeting the, the agency that those machines represented, which is you know, the factory owners. Um, and so I think when, when I think about agency, I always think about not what agency but whose agency because there's always a person behind every piece of code behind every piece of machinery there's always people um hidden inside right yeah it's hard to remove that bias entirely from the machine um, well, you, you can't either because you can't have a human without bias right and so you therefore you you, you simply cannot remove the bias what you can do is you can um, bury it so deep that it appears to not be there right so um we have another question and this is particularly timely because it's back to school season and a lot of school is now online so um very timely 
So here's a question, how should we teach children about technology? How can we best equip or protect the future generation from being manipulated by this data? And how can they help to make technology more equitable, if that is even possible? Well, um, I yeah. think a good first step is reading my book. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it has been enjoyed by 11-year-olds and by 85-year-olds. Uh, and I, reading something together as a family, I, I mean, obviously, I'm a professor. Like, it's, reading is one of the ways that I understand the world. But reading something together as a family and talking about it uh, can be really powerful. I, I think that I, there has been a lot of conversation about social media, about bullying. Absolutely, these things should be in the public conversation. Um, but other good things to talk about are how much do you feel comfortable sharing online? I, as a parent, you know, after your kid is like five or so, they probably have really strong feelings about whether they want to be in your social media feeds or not. Um, and giving your kid the power to say, that's okay that you post this about me, or no, it's not okay that you post this about me, that's a good way of teaching them that they have agency in the world and they have the right to uh, control their image and they have the right to speak up. Um, you know, for a really long time, the kid will probably say, yes, it's totally fine to put this on your Insta or whatever. And then they will go through a period where they're like, no, you may not admit that you know me in public. Uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, they'll probably get to another, uh, get to another point where you're allowed to post about them again. Um, we have a talk about that actually called Sharon Hood. <laughs> How do you know? Yeah. All right. Putting that on the reading list too. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I uh, completely agree. Read Meredith's book. <laughs> that that is a that is a very good first step. Um, and then you can pick mine up. I I think our I think our books are are very good kind of one two jab at um, uh, kind of demystifying m many different myths, right? And 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 uh, so very very much a, a complementary pair. I I think about it in terms of you know it's like. I think I think we could all learn from this, not just children, but, you know, as with sex, uh, it's not a, an abstinence only approach to technology is not a very effective way of going about it. Right. It's the point is not to um, say you, you, you can't use any technology. You can't use this technology because it's, you know, it's it's dangerous. It's invading your pride, whatever. Right. The point is not that kind of abstinence approach. The point is to be. Um, safe and selective about about what technologies you engage with, right? To be aware um, about how to use these technologies in a in a really safe way, in a way that kind of preserves your privacy, um, preserves your image, preserves your rights, preserves whatever values you really care about. Um, to be so be safe about that, and there you know find there are a lot of resources um, out there for for knowing how to do that, and be selective, right? to be um, intentional in your choices about what technologies you integrate into your life and understanding that you are, by using technologies, you are integrating them into your life and, and changing the patterns of your life through that. Um, you know, another, a person who's, whose work I, uh, my book is very much in the spirit of is um, Langdon Winner another MIT Press author who wrote, I think, a, a really fantastic book called Autonomous Technology. And in, in a lot of ways, I see my book as um, a, you know, a spiritual successor, I hope, in some way to, to Langdon Winner's work and book. And he has this idea of, of technological somnambulism which is this idea that we are sleepwalking through technological society, that we are not being um, very selective or intentional or aware or attentive about what technologies we use, um, how we integrate them into our lives, how they change the basic patterns of, of, of our lives um, and of society. And so, you know, I, I think 
a, there's a lot that can be done just by, um, again, not, not swinging the pendulum to that other side of a kind of abstinence only approach, but just being safe and selective. And one of the things I think that's hard about uh, being a parent and teaching your kids about technology is that you do have to be one step ahead of them for a really long time. And there's this myth that kids today are digital natives. And that can be a, a dangerous misconception because the kids can think that they're ready to do a whole lot of stuff that they're not ready to do. And the parents can be like, oh, well, the kid knows what they're doing and then the kid can get in trouble. You know, the kid ends up on, you know, the video game chat and ends up giving away their parents credit card number because they met somebody nice who said that you know, they needed the credit card number to like get a skin for the game. Like, it, you know, stuff like this happens all the time. So you do need to know what your kids are doing on the computer. And for that, like, yeah, you do need to be one step ahead of them. Uh, I'm not saying get all up in their business all the time because kids need privacy and freedom the mm -hmm. same way that adults do. Uh, but until you're sure that they are acting online the way that they that you want them to act in real life, you know, you do kind of need to keep an eye on things online the same way that you keep an eye on things in real life. Oh, and, that, and that's such a good point, Meredith, as well as pl please do not become the person that that uses all of these technologies on your kid right do not become oh, yeah. that like techno authoritarian yeah. yeah because there there are a whole suite of like of, of like kid tracking apps and stuff that parents can um install on their kids phones you know i i even know of parents that have like you know in, in like webcams set up in like the house so that they can like you know keep an eye on that you know it's like the it's like the nanny cam 2.0 bigger badder and you know more invasive um and it's like don't you know do, do not uh buy into this idea that the smart parent is the like overbearing you know always tracking parent <laughs> right right um i actually think it starts with the baby monitor like the, the audio baby monitor was great because you could hear your baby crying from far away, but then the video baby monitor, uh, once those became ubiquitous, I, parents started getting more comfortable with surveillance. And so I had this friend who, uh, her kid was five and she was still using the video baby monitor. And I was like, wait a minute, like why are you still watching your kid? while he sleeps like he's five years old like he doesn't need to be so while he's sleeping anymore like sudden infant death syndrome is like is well in and she was like oh well you know i'm a, i'm kind of anxious so it just makes me feel better to see him and it may make you feel better but it's it's good to sit with that feeling and say why are you so anxious about your kid doing something like sleeping by himself it, mm. I mean, that, that there's something else going on at that point. And, you know, when your kid is five, like, and you're still using the baby monitor, like you're spying on your kid. <laughs> so we're not judging people with baby monitors, but maybe a little people with five-year-olds using baby monitors. <laughs> yeah, five, five is too old to be surveilling your kid with the baby monitor. Great. So um, we have one last question, and we are right at 6.30, so we're just a little bit behind but but if you have time we can ask one more question otherwise we can sign off for the day sure and i think it's a, a very related question to to what we've been talking about so i think we can kind of riff on it very quickly and then and then wrap up okay great so uh meredith and jason i would like to ask you if you see any more ways to get pe more people to think critically about technology and dismantle the myth of technology as the best slash most neutral answer? I've got the answer to this. You just pick up Meredith and I's book, Artificial and Intelligence and Too Smart, and, and bingo, bingo, myths debunked. <laughs> yeah. Um, another place I like to direct people is to an organization that I'm involved with at NYU called the Center for Critical Race and Technology. Uh, Yes, sorry, Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. 
Uh, and on the CRGS site, there is a syllabus that has a wonderful reading list uh, about uh, critical technology studies. Uh, Jathan mentioned some fantastic books earlier uh, earlier in our conversation. Uh, maybe those can go into the chat or get posted afterward. Um, and then there's also something that just went up yesterday on public books. Uh, it's called, I think, Extra Credit, Writing About the Internet. It's by Annie Galvin. Uh, and it is a series of podcasts. Uh, I appear on one with Margaret O'Mara, uh, whose amazing book, The Code, is a history of Silicon Valley. Uh, and so it's a set of podcasts. It's a bunch of discussion questions and also a bunch of curricular resources. So I think you'll have a lot of fun checking that out. Great. So I've shared the website for the Critical Race and Digital Studies um, program you were talking about. And um, it, do you have any other links or resources you would like for me to share in the chat? I'm a very fast typer. I can get it all in. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maybe we'll send them afterward. All right. Cool. Yeah, we can send them around the, in the email afterward. And then, of course, I'll send the books links um, one more time just in case anyone missed it. Um, but I do think these two books are perfect resources for this topic. So you'll have a lot of reading to do, everyone. <laughs> All right, so thanks again for joining us, Meredith and Jason. Um, have a great day and, you know, we really value your time. All right, thanks. thanks. This was such a pleasure. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>